So this morning, what I'd like to do, we'll cover a little bit of new ground, but uh, not much. I just want to, it's it's been a number of weeks since we've been on this, I want to just do a little bit of review today, uh, cover some new ground, finish off. What we've been looking at is, I guess, the harmony in the Gospels of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. And uh, those chapters all record the same uh, teaching, some in differing detail, and uh, we've been looking at how the harmony goes together there and how they, they line up. So we will come to, the, come to that this morning, but I want to just skim through our, our previous lessons a little, try and reach right back into last year where we were doing some foundational work in, uh, in prophecies of the Old Testament and into Revelation, just get our heads back on things. Uh, Before we do so, we'll have a word of prayer, ask the Lord to help us. need to pray for us this morning. Uh, I've been messaging Pastor Tim Bunch from uh, Garden City and he's out in Toowoomba and he's out at Taroom preaching this morning and just I mentioned that we'd be praying for him. So I'd like to just uh, lift him up in prayer this morning for the meetings out there at Taroom uh, and just pray the Lord have his hand upon him. So uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord and uh, ask for the Lord's help. Reg, can I spring it on you, please, brother? Is that all right? Amen. All righty. So let's, uh, let's go right back to, to uh, last year. And uh, we, we started, one of the first places we started was looking at uh, what we might call the dispensations, uh, the, the allocations of time whereby the Lord worked a little differently at times. And uh, He hasn't changed, but He has changed how He deals with us over time. And uh, he has changed what his expectations are of us, at least of mankind. So uh, when, we t- when we use the word dispensations, we get it uh, from, uh, from the New Testament, but it also might come across the word stewardship. It's got the idea of a stewardship, a period of time where something is entrusted to you and uh, the things that the Lord's entrusted to mankind over certain periods of time. So what... What might we call the the first, or how might we identify the first dispensation? The first stewardship. Innocence. We might talk about the dispensation of innocence. Where would that be? what, what What sort of part of the Bible might we associate with that? Creation? Yeah? Any other identifiers? Because we could say that creation is now, too, like we enjoy creation now, the Lord's creation. Before the fall? Okay, so Garden of Eden, before the fall. What might we call it straight after the fall? What did man have a consciousness of? Sorry, Tara? I think, you, look, you started with the right. Sin. Uh, yeah, sin. I, uh, <laughs> they had a consciousness of sin, right? And so we might call it the dispensation of conscious. Conscience. Uh, then... then we step in and after Noah, we see governments established and nations established. We'll be having a look at that a little uh, in Sunday, my Sunday morning service. With Abraham, what was, uh, what, was some, what was some of the Lord's first dealings with Abraham? Some of the Lord, first things the Lord gave to Abraham. Promises. He, the Lord gave Abraham 
promises, covenants. And so we might say there's a dispensation of promise in around Abraham and that stewardship there. But after Abraham, we step into Moses and God didn't just have a promise and a covenant, but in Moses' day, what did God give? Up on a mountain? In a cloud? Come on now, don't be shy. The law. The tables? The law. <laughs> he gave the law, right? And so it's not that there wasn't any law beforehand, but there was, there was a change of knowledge and stewardship. All of a sudden, God had entrusted into Israel's hands a law to be kept that he hadn't entrusted with them with beforehand. You see how it's a change of stewardship? He's entrusted something again, a dispensation. After the law, what are we in right now? The dispensation, and this is where we get the word dispensation from a reference that says that this is the dispensation of what? Dispensation of grace. What else might we call it? Of the church. We might refer to it as the church age, the stewardship of the church. What's the next one that's coming? What might we call that? Sorry? Judgment? A little bit before judgment. Like that gap between the church and judgment. Tribulation, but after the tribulation, what's the tribulation bring in? Come on now. Sorry? Help me out. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting on? And what's he going to do when he returns? Cook waffles? What's he coming to do? Sorry? It's not judge, Benny. This, I mean, like, you're close, mate. You're close. Reign. He's coming to reign. And what, do you, what does a king reign over? A kingdom. So we might call it the dispensation of the kingdom of God. We're just trying... Some of the terms are terms that we just might come up with to go... We're talking about the millennial reign or we're talking about the kingdom age, that time of Christ's reign. So we can see some clear breakups in the scriptures where there's different things entrusted at different times, different dealings that God has with mankind. So we looked at those dispensations. We also looked at three people groups. <clears throat> three people groups in, in the Bible uh, that really, whilst there are many uh, kindred tongues and nations, in the Scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, you come to three groups of people. What are those three main people groups? Jews, Gentiles... And the church runs the church of God. Very good. So we see, we see that the Lord talks about the Jews, the Gentiles, and the church of God. We see that in 1 Corinthians 10. All right. Drop back to, uh, if you remember, drop back to, to Daniel and the, the, the visions he had uh, or that he wrote of. Let's have a look at Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So this wasn't Daniel's vision, this was Nebuchadnezzar's vision, a vision God gave ne King Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interpreted. Daniel gave the understanding of. Remember that? What was Nebuchadnezzar's dream of? What did Nebuchadnezzar see? A statue? He saw that, that, that statue whose, whose uh, head was of gold... Then what was the next one down? Silver of his, of his torso and the brass. What was after the brass on his legs? Iron and his feet were iron mixed with clay. All right. What did... Let's not worry about each individual step. Overall, what did Daniel say? What, did, what was this vision about? Was it, a, was it a vision about monetary value of me, precious metals? What was it a vision about? Sorry? Yeah, kingdoms. A breakup of kingdoms after kingdom after kingdom. Down to the last kingdom. And you see there's a change of kingdom with each change of metal, right? But on the last one, there's not a change of metal. There is a mingling of metal and clay, of that same metal and the clay that goes with it. What was the very end of the vision? What happened to the feet at the end of the vision? By what? Smashed by what? Sorry? A stone. A stone carved out. Yeah, not by hands. All right? 
So a stone carved out not by hands broke up that feet of iron and clay. What is the stone picture? Sorry? Jesus. You're all over it, Tara. You're whispering, but you're smashing the answers. You're all over it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So then Daniel had a dream. That was in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 7, we see Daniel had a dream. What did Daniel dream about? It was still about kingdoms, but what were the kingdoms depicted as? They weren't depicted as statues and, and, uh, and medals. What were they depicted as is in Daniel's dream? Animals, or we might say beasts, because they're no animal that we know. All right? The first, I'll give you these, I don't expect you to remember them. The first one was a lion mixed with, uh, sorry, a lion with eagle's wings. The next was a bear eating three ribs. The, fir- the, the third was a leopard with wings. The, the fourth was a beast that was diverse from all the others. And then lastly, it wasn't a beast. What was the last thing that was noted in Daniel's vision? A little horn. It wasn't the beast itself, it was the, the ten horns and the little horn that came up. What was the little horn that came up depicting of? Sorry? No? Benny backed out. Anyone else? The Antichrist. Here's the thing. We had at the close of Nebuchadnezzar's vision a stone not carved out by hands which spoke to us of Christ and at the end of Daniel's dream we have a little horn that speaks of the Antichrist. Okay? Okay? And so we're seeing this in the Old Testament. And the kingdoms we look at, uh, we, we know it's the Babylonian, the Persian, uh, the Grecian, and the Roman. Um, and, and then so then when you step into the iron mixed with clay, you see the iron ro- empire, the iron empire, the, the Roman empire, which it, I understand it to be the, really the democratic process whereby we follow today is a mixture of that Roman empire sewn in across the nations. We follow a lot of Roman... Roman Empire practice when it comes to our governance in the democratic nations around the world. Uh, There's a number of applications there, but when we talk kingdoms, we see that. All right, there was two aspects of Christ's ministry, Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. What is it in Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2, that divides? what What is the thing in God's Word that separates the two aspects of God's, of Christ's ministry? We've already spoken about his coming reign as king. What was his previous ministry and his current ministry? What was his ministry on earth when he first came? Service, to seek and to save that which is lost, right? He came meek and lowly, and so we see his his ministry as a servant in saving the people, and then we see his ministry coming as a king to reign over the people. And what is it on Isaiah that separates those two? What grammatically separates them? A comma. Nothing more than a comma in Isaiah 61. And that comma, how long has that comma lasted so far? Pardon? Where is it, Benny? 2,000. Give us a few more years, Benny. 2024 years. You're mumbling into the floor, Benny. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a 2,000 year comma, okay? And so we just want to be aware of those things. All right. We had looked at, at the two olive branches. In, uh, in, Romans, in Romans 9, we see the election of Israel and, um, and we see uh, God's using of Israel and uh, God's hardening of Israel's heart and... Blindness in Romans 11, we see blindness in part has come upon Israel until what? Blindness in part has come upon Israel until the fullness of... Sorry, Ron? Nope, not the fullness of time. Close. What was that? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. We see the two, olive, we see the two branches... The, the natural olive branch of Israel and the wild olive branch of the Gentiles grafted in. And, and that's grafted in, the blindness in coming to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. It's only a temporary thing. And Romans talks about Israel being grafted in again. 
All right. So is this bringing things back to mind? Are you feeling like you're catching up? Um, we did a run through Revelation, looking at the things which are. What chapters of Revelation deal with the things which are? Who taught that lesson? Was that Glenn? The things which are. Go to Revelation. What's, the, what's at the start of Revelation? Yeah, the letter to the seven churches, right? And so here's, a, here's, here's, a th- here's the start of Revelation writing to seven churches that were actually in existence in Asia Minor, and here's the things that it, which are. The things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. We did, we had a look at, we just ran through Revelation looking at the things that John saw. Then we spent some time looking at the seven churches. I'm pretty sure Glenn taught on that, at the things which are. And we ran through then looking at the things which shall be hereafter. We looked at, I'll just give you these real quick. We look at, looked at the great wonder in heaven in Revelation 12, the woman uh, and, uh, and the dragon and uh, the deliverance of the woman's child. We looked at some post-tribulation events as they uh, were listed out there. And then we dropped back and we had a look at, um, and this is where we've been considering the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. We've been taking this fair bit of time here. I planned on doing this in two lessons, but as we looked at the pre-trib rapture of the church, there are a number of questions, there are a number of uncertainties, there are a number of things that weren't understood. So we just slowed right down and started to walk through step by step um, at, at, uh, at the pre-tribulational rapture of the church. We looked at the promised return and reception that God gave in John 14 and in Acts 1. We had a look in 1 Thessalonians 4 about the catching up and, uh, and the being changed in 1 Corinthians 15. In, in 1 Thessalonians it says we'll be caught up. In 1 Corinthians it says we'll be changed. And the two things speak in the same speak of the same occurrence. Uh, we looked in Revelation where we saw these things um, in Revelation 4, Revelation 12, and we compared Acts chapter 1 where Jesus ascended into heaven with Revelation chapter 19 where Jesus comes with power and great glory and we compared the same manner and there were similarities but it wasn't the same. He came in the air, but he came very. He comes in Revelation 19, very different to how he ascended in Acts chapter one. Then we got to this. Do you remember this? This is a, a timeline that is based on uh, Second Thessalonians, and uh, and in Second Thessalonians, let's go there, we'll slow because that brings us to where we're at up to. We've got about. We've got about 10 minutes and um, I just felt it necessary to get us all back up to, to speed at least on the things we've been considering here. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Is anyone else flipping past it? I just keep on going either side. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll start reading in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now we hold up, but I'm fully persuaded that we are anticipating a pre-tribulational rapture of the church before the return of Christ. What are the other two common positions? a post-tribulational rapture of the church, that after the tribulation, then the church will be taken out before the millennial reign of Christ. There's one other common position. 
of those that look for the tribulation, for the rapture of the church. A pre, a post, mid, a mid tribulation. That that there, in the middle of that tribulation period, that seventy. That's what we did. I skipped them on my notes because remember we looked at the Daniel seventieth week. They're not in my notes because Glenn taught that lesson, and he taught it taught in on the seventieth week of Daniel and that time of that time of tribulation, that seven year period. And so, then how do we understand 2 Thessalonians? We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. The day of Christ shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The, the day of Christ shall not come until there be, unless there be a falling away first, and the man of sin, the red is the man of sin, okay, be revealed. And so Christ isn't coming until the man of sin is revealed, right? And so on the surface here, this is where a lot of people will go, well, that's a post-tribulational rapture because Christ's not coming until after this man of sin has been revealed. But we, we went back and we did this slowly and we did it in much more detail, but I'll just give you the, 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 the headlines of it, if you like. In verse 1, he's beseeching them on two things, the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together unto him. I asked you the first time, I asked you in, when we first looked at this, what, when, did Christ, when did Christ come the first time? Give me the specifics. When did Christ come the first time? Not the date. Give me something in the Bible about when Christ came. When he was born. Okay, so what was he in Mary's womb? Was he on earth or was he in heaven? We go, no, he was in Mary's womb, right? He'd left the throne. He was on earth, but he was in Mary's womb. So my point being, we... we we look at it and go, oh, the coming of Christ was, and always have, the coming of Christ, and quite rightly so, at his birth. But we understand that he also, he came before his birth into his mother's womb when, she, when he was conceived, right, of the Holy Ghost. And he was there present on this earth in Mary's womb. That whole process of, of nine months is the first coming of Christ. And what people want to do and what the tendency to do is go, well, the second coming of Christ, we've got, we've got to go, well, the second coming and then the third coming and the fourth coming. The, well, if we do that, then his first coming was the Garden of Eden when he walked in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. His second coming was perhaps Melchizedek, depending on what you want to do with him. I don't do that. I don't make him Christ, but some do. His third coming would be, would it be Abraham when he... When he met with Abraham on the plains of Mamre before they destroyed... So all of, what, if we're going to say every time Christ appeared, every time the Son of God appeared on this earth, we're going to call it a, a coming of Christ, then His first coming isn't His first coming. His first coming is about His fifth coming, sixth coming. But there is a first coming of Christ when He came and was born of a man, when He Son of Man came. See, those other ones, he didn't come as the son of man, he came as the son of God. But he came as the son of man, there where he was conceived in Mary's womb. That was his first coming. But even in that, there's three, there's three major points in his life. His conception, his birth, and his entrance into his ministry. Whilst he came as saviour at his birth, he didn't enact his work as saviour until he was 30 years old. That's when he entered into his ministry. And so what was he doing beforehand? He was here those whole 30 years, that whole period of time. And so when we step and we go, well, what's the second coming of Christ? Some will come out and go, well, I'm going to talk about each individual point where he, where he comes down. Well, then what are you going to do when he ascended and, and Mary couldn't touch him because he had not yet ascended unto the Father. It seemed like he had not risen from the grave and applied the blood to the altar in heaven. But afterwards, he, he asked Thomas, Pass your, pa place your hand into my side. 
what had happened between. He'd ascended and then come back and then he'd ascended that last time that we see recorded. We see Christ able to come and go with, and look at, look at that second coming and go, well, we have him coming in the clouds in great, in great glory. We have him in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 coming with a trump. And seven years later, we see him coming in the clouds with great glory with 10,000 of his angels, uh, 10,000 of his saints, sorry, and the word of God proceed, proceeding out of his mouth like a two edged sword. If we get specific in the word of God, that's the coming of Christ, that's the day of Christ. But in all of that, he is, is his, the, the, the practice of his second coming and the portions of his second coming. That that we're entering into that, he comes, he calls his saints home. And so in, in 1 Thessalonians, where it says, sorry, in 2 Thessalonians here, where it says that the day of Christ shall not be until there, until there be a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. Here's that man of sin that's revealed who opposeth himself and exalteth himself above all that is called God. He's revealed, he exalts himself and we know that he'll later be destroyed uh, by the Lord. And in verse 8, Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and he, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And, when that's, when, and then shall that wicked be revealed. So we're told that there is something that withholds, that lets like a net in tennis. There's something that withholds the man of sin from being revealed. And when he that withholdeth is taken out of the way, then shall that man of sin be revealed. And after that shall become the second coming of Christ. So when he that withholdeth is taken out of the way, and he that withholds the working of Satan is the Holy Spirit, whose presence on this earth now is indwelling in the hearts and lives of the believers. And so when the when he that withholdeth is taken out of the way, when the Holy Spirit moved in to me and I became a new creature, that was an eternal life that will never be taken out of the way. If the Holy Spirit's getting taken, taken out of this earth, I'm going with him. Because I have been made a new creature in Christ. And so we see the rapture of the church being described in 2 Thessalonians as the taking out of the way of the Holy Spirit that is indwelling in the hearts of his believers. And so we see he that withholdeth is taken out of the way, the man of sin is revealed, he exalts himself, and he will be destroyed at the second coming of Christ. And we worked through this step by step. We then stepped into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and did this comparison here. And, and this is where I want to pick back up and we'll get back into this next week and finish this off. These are just the remnants of our notes that uh, was working through all this. Just trying to compare. Matthew and Mark, they give us this, the end is not yet. It gives us the beginning of sorrows. Then shall the end come. False Christ, false prophets. The Son of Man come in the clouds. Go with me to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. And I'll finish with this because this is pretty much where we finished. You finish and just give you something, something brief to add to this. Luke chapter 21. And I have entirely the wrong verse written down. Oh, where is it? Help me find, I've got verse 2 and it is not verse 2 I'm after. Help me find Jerusalem compassed with armies. Verse 20. Is that what someone... There we go. I just missed the zero. That's my dyslexia playing up on me. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. When we come to the Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark and Luke run through this teaching of Christ, but Luke gives us a great deal more detail. And this verse is in the midst of that detail. I know I'm skipping, but I'm trying to just catch us up again, okay? So if, this, if you haven't been sitting in, there's big gaps I'm leaving, right? You'll just have to follow along in the teachings online. But 
when we come to Matthew, Luke 21, verse 20, the Lord says, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Can I give you a history lesson? And I normally close with a Bible verse, but I'll close with a history lesson. In 70 AD, Titus came from Alexandria to Caesarea, where he gathered his forces together and then marched to Jerusalem with four legions and the auxiliaries of the neighbouring kings. This is recorded history. He besieged the city a number of days before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So he besieged Jerusalem in 70 AD. On Saturday the 14th of April, Titus surrounded the city and he built a wall so that no one could flee from it, nor could anything be brought into it. Within three days, he built a wall about five miles long right around the city and stationed his army around that wall. And as a result, famine prevailed in the city to such an extent and raged so cruelly that not only did the common people die of it, but the seditious men that were rising up against the Roman Empire, which is why Titus came, were severely oppressed by it. In a three-month period, through one gate of the city, this wasn't through all the gates, this was just measuring those that went through one gate of the city, in three months, 115,800 corpses were buried by the common expense. That's not counting the corpses that were buried by family and friends. That's just the corpses that were buried in a three-month period that died of this famine. It's estimated that there were about three million people besieged in the city because they'd come in for the Feast of Unleavened Bread when Titus came in and sieged it. The famine was so great that it's in that time in history that a mother devoured her own child to relieve herself of the famine. And that's recorded in, in, in just the history of how that went down. On Saturday, September the 8th, 14th of April, they were besieged. On the 8th of September, Jerusalem was destroyed. That's after Christ had said this. Some of what we look at in Christ's prophecy isn't about what will come to pass after 2024. Some of it gives us what has come to pass between the days of Christ and 2024. And so we see it fulfilled in history as well as it been waiting to be fulfilled out in front of us. The Gospel of Luke gives us this detail that Matthew and Mark doesn't. We'll look at it a little more next week. But that brings us up to date. Any questions? All right. I know that was a quick review. I know there's lots of gaps there, but all of that is uh, in the... If you want more details on that, it's all online there where you can access that. Um, But that gets us back up to speed. Let's close with a word of prayer. If Lily's finished, we'll be able to get a cup of tea, but we will have to patiently wait on her. So, uh, Kobe, can I ask you to close in prayer, please, bro? Amen. Amen.